There were approximately 1,700 women, elderly men, and children that were forced marched in 1862, and it was it began in what is present-day Morton, Minnesota. And what we know are the names of the women who are the heads of the families, and then uh, listed behind their name were the number of family members that were forced marched with them. Every mile from Morton, Minnesota to Fort Snelling, we honor two families and um, we say prayers and, and we're walking in a ceremonial manner and um, a way of reclaiming our sacred space in our Dakota homeland because we don't have physical or legal control of our sacred spaces. One of the marchers brought her three children that she's taking care of and I watched them and then I imagine what those children on this march back in 1862 must have felt. They say, Mom, I'm hungry. Mom, I'm cold. Mom, where are we going? Mom, are we ever going to go home? And of course, they're not going to go home. They're going to be forcibly removed from their, our ancient homelands here in Minnesota. We saw that there was a great need to bring attention to the history and to also um, find a way for mainstream society to acknowledge the atrocities that happened in 1862. And so we formed um, this ceremony, a way of healing for relatives and um, organized the Dakota commemorative, what's known as the Dakota commemorative marches. The march is primarily for remembering and honoring those 1700 women, children, and some elders who were force marched that 150 miles from southwestern Minnesota to the concentration camp at Fort Snelling. My um, grandmother was raised by her grandmother when she was three years old. She was there with her mother and how they escaped from Minnesota and that she never saw her father again from that point. And there's a, a tradition in our community where you do a spirit plate and you you know, acknowledge the ancestors and her and their memories. And because she didn't know what happened to her father, she didn't know where his resting place was, it was always important for her to do the spirit plate because she didn't know where he was. And, and you know, the prayer she would say really made an impression on me. Where you are, I hope you're being taken care of. I, you know, I hope you're not cold. I hope you're being fed. The fact that uh, that these women and children suffered just as much as the worst genocide that may have occurred among people of the world. That fulfills criterion C of the 1948 UN Genocide Convention where it says, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And so this did that. Legacy of violence against women. Many women were killed along the way. Um, during the forced march and at Fort Snelling and there are stories from the oral tradition how young pubescent girls were raped by soldiers and then killed. They never found their bodies, they never saw them again. Dozens of our uh, Dakota women were killed, murdered along this way. Like I had myself had a grandmother who who was bayoneted in the stomach by a soldier on horseback and her what was her sin? Her sin was not understanding the English language, the order that was given by this white soldier. And when she didn't obey, the white soldier got mad and killed her. As women, we have this word squaw, you know, this derogatory term. And I don't know of any other culture that has a derogatory term for their women. It's happening in communities with you know young people having ideation and the high suicide rate. They don't graduate from high school. The, you can see there's a legacy of mistreatment that happened in 1862. And nobody has really done anything to repair those harms. Killing members of the group, what are bounties? You know bounties that were placed on Dakota scalps. Uh, what are mass executions <laughs> deliberately done? The suppression of our religions, the suppression of our language and all that. So that today, like in my community of 450 people, we have four 
people who, who are fluent in the Dakota language. Lower Sioux maybe has one. How painful that must have been to be separated from beloved brothers, fathers, uncles, who are the providers and the protect, protectors uh, for their community and to be separated from them. And I know of in no country where combatants for a sovereign nation are tried and hanged for protecting their families and for protecting their homeland and their nation. 1862, the day after Christmas, 38 Dakota warriors were hanged here on a giant, they were hanged simultaneously on a giant four-cornered gallows with 10 notches, 10 nooses on each side. And those men who were hanged, the Dakota warriors who were hanged, were um, the remnant of 303 who originally were sentenced to die. In military tribunals, people were just asked, did you fight in the battle? And if a warrior said yes, and they said, did you shoot your gun? Yes, guilty. Lincoln wrestled with it, but decided that in the interest of keeping the frontier people of Minnesota pacified and not making them go on a lynch mob tear, he decided we had to hang some. They sang their death songs in Dakota and rocked back and forth till the whole huge gallows was rocking. Uh, 10,000 people had come to see the spectacle. Now, Governor Perpich in 1987, that year of reconciliation, proposed pardoning all 38. And the Dakota said then, no, pardoning implies they were guilty and deserved their fate. So what should uh, white Minnesotans think? I think they need to think about telling the truth about what really happened here, acknowledging the truth and telling the truth, and then secondly, to begin dialogues, serious dialogues about like land reparations, how to pay for the land that they stole. Like for example, in our Treaty of 1805 involves about 155,000 acres on which St. Paul and Minneapolis are located. We haven't been paid for that land. I was a history major <laughs> in college and this was new to me. It was something that, that had slipped by. I hadn't really heard it or understood the, the depth of what it really means. I like the emphasis that's been made on, on having a dialogue instead of a debate. And there, there comes a time when learning about our differences is very important, but what's most important, I think, is to have an atmosphere where we can express ourselves and say what it is that is important to us and, and be able to honor each other for what it is that we all bring to the table. Jack Weatherford, author of Native Roots, said when he looked at the photographs of Fort Snelling, he said it was eerie. He said, looking at these photographs, I felt like I was watching the birth of an institution that was to haunt the 20th century. The social practice of the military gathering up non-combatants and citizens, holding them there for prolonged periods of time without charging them with any crime. They died of hunger, cold, thirst, and, and just plain despair. We need to honor these women and children as much as we put on a pedestal those 38 Dakota who were hanged at Mankato. If it weren't for these women and children who survived, we wouldn't be here. These woods down below are the site of the prison camp or squaw camp as some of the soldiers at Fort Snelling referred to it during the harsh winter of 1862-63. Almost 2,000 Dakota prisoners, mostly men, I mean, excuse me, mostly elderly men, women, and children, many of them, most of them women and children, were confined behind stockades in this little flatland here near the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers right below Fort Snelling and they suffered terribly. The men folk mostly were in prison in Mankato or awaiting exile and in some cases, many cases, execution or their men were had fled out into the western prairies even up into Canada and he died of disease some starvation some of abuse until the spring of 1863 when they were put on boats and exiled down the Mississippi up the Missouri River and dumped out in the middle of the South Dakota prairie 
which was just really a desert. Behind these barricades were the teepees of the women and children, the grieving, the sorrowful, the soon-to-be deported from their homeland, Dakota, the remnants of Minnesota's original Dakota nation waited to be removed from their homeland.